Carlos Costa from IBM Research. I'm a principal research scientist. Uh, I uh, oversee the foundation model platform. So this is our platform for the whole life cycle of foundation models. If you haven't heard this term before, I'm talking about things like LLMs, but uh, broader, right? So language, but other domains as well. So today I have my colleague from Red Hat, Alex Corvin, uh, engineering manager uh, at Red Hat, and Hong Chao uh, Deng, uh, software engineer at uh, Inscale. And uh, we share with you uh, how we're building this platform uh, through OpenShift AI and some of our uh, open source uh, partners, uh, in this case, Array and Anyscale. So I'll tell you this story. Um, do I have my charts up? Uh -huh. Yeah, OK. Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, give us just a sec. OK. Um, I see it here, not on the screen yet. OK, so here we go, right? And I'll actually use one of our use cases with NASA. We train one of the largest uh, foundation models out there with NASA on geospatial data. And I'll tell you how we use this platform for that use case, right? Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the, the emerging, emerging challenges, right? Um, foundation model is really changing uh, the whole workflow for AI, right? Uh, of course, we all seen this. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side is the old uh, old way to do things where I had to train uh, a model if I want to actually apply, say, a model to anomaly detection, for example, right? What I need to do, I'll basically need to create data, right? Uh, uh, choose a, a machine learning technique, do a lot of validation, apply this in the field, get results, and that was like an year already, right? Reason why uh, we didn't see like a lot of these models that really apply in the field, right? Foundational model is what you see in the, in the right-hand side here. And uh, we all heard about things like Alama 2, all these like, language models, where you can actually start from a very general model, and then you can adapt this model to a specific domain. Say, I want to do anomaly detection in a specific data set, for example, right? You can start with some of these base models, fine tune it, that's the key word, right? Apply it to your use case. So you basically shorten the whole development of machine learning now. And that's why for the enterprise, it's ex just exploding, right? Everybody's trying to do this because you basically change the economy of scale, right? Time to value got much, much shortened. Um, the problem here is that uh, uh, it brings a whole new set of challenges, right? Because when you're talking about uh, foundational models, you're talking about uh, a whole workflow, right? You don't have to go through every single of these steps for every single of your use cases, but it's still to be able to come up with a solution, right? You still have to do things like a data preparation if you want to train your own model. Uh, if you're also doing model training from scratch, you probably want to do distributed training. Not everybody does this, I should say, right? Uh, but many uh, want to start from scratch. If, you're, for example, in a regulated industry, so if you're one of the big banks here, Bradesk was just here, you might have enough uh, firepower to, uh, to train your own model. But if you're a smaller shop, you might want to just do model adaptation, right? My second to last step here, we are basically just bring some of your uh, own data to fine tune and adapt the model. And then there is the inference, right? So what is interesting here is that while this is a workflow, if you look at this, it's very much heterogeneous. The type of uh, hardware uh, and scale that you use across this workflow is very much different, right? So when you're talking about uh, data preparation, for example, these are CPU-only jobs, scale-out type of things, right? Uh, here, you basically want to grab as many uh, CPU cores as you can to do some, for example, data filtering, removal of, um, for example, hate and abuse speech. We don't want this to get into your model, for example, right? When it comes to distributed training, it is all about specialized hardware. We're talking about GPUs, right? The, the world is talking about GPUs these days, right? So here's where you need a platform that runs very well on specialized hardware. Uh, sometimes for true large-scale distributed training, you're talking about very large-scale uh, type of uh, infrastructure, right? As you move towards the right-hand side, uh, you still need some specialization. When you're doing model tuning, you still need like a, a number of GPUs, not hundreds, more like a, a few, right? For example, to fine tune Llama 2 model, or one of the most popular models out there, you can do very good fine tuning, say, with four GPUs in a couple of hours, right? Um, and then you might have like a 
multiple of these kind of fine-tuned tasks at the same time, right? And then if you go all the way to the right-hand side, it's all about uh, 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 how much requests you can actually handle, throughput, latency, right? When it comes to model serving, it might be GPU, it might be CPU even, right? It's all about a compromise of latency uh, and, and throughput. Long story short, so if you're building a platform to accommodate this whole life cycle, how it should look like, right? So from here, we'll take you through a, a piece, uh, several pieces of open source technology that you bring together on top of OpenShift to enable this uh, workflow end to end. So I invite uh, Alex to take you through that, and then I'll come back with a use case. Thank you. So yeah, I want to tell you about OpenShift AI, which is Red Hat's end-to-end uh, -end AI and ML lifecycle uh, platform running on OpenShift. So OpenShift AI is a collection of a number of really best-in-class open source projects that we come to that we that we pull together into a single integrated cohesive platform all running on OpenShift, which allows us to leverage the great powers of, of OpenShift across the hybrid cloud. Uh, OpenShift AI really helps you deliver value with your models faster. You have your data scientists creating models, training those models. Every step of the end-to-end -end life cycle, you're running on the exact same platform. And it's the exact same platform that you're already running your traditional non-intelligent applications on today. That means your operations teams can leverage the exact same GitOps workflows that they, that they already have to get traditional applications and your new intelligent applications into production faster. All of these projects are coming together into a project that we created in, uh, called the Open Data Hub, which is an open source collection of tools that we incubate these new projects and features in before we harden them, or as we're hardening them for, for enterprise readiness. They then come down into the Red Hat OpenShift AI product when we deem them ready for enterprise use. There's two key areas of the AI ML lifecycle that I want to highlight some of the innovations we're, we're doing. Uh, specifically, they are the, the training and the serving steps. Specifically on the training side, some of the key challenges that we're seeing, particularly in the generative AI space, is just the scale that it can take to create some of these really powerful models. We see that they require, oftentimes, significant amounts of very specialized hardware. Um, and with our OpenShift AI training stack, we aim to make it very easy for data scientists to get access to that training hardware, while also making it really easy for operations teams to make sure that the data scientists don't run wild and incur ridiculous cloud costs, or that the very scarce specialized hardware like GPUs are used only for the most important, highest priority tasks. A lot of the innovation we're doing is coming through a project called CodeFlare. It's an open source project that we, we uh, created along with, with IBM. Uh, and there's, there's three key components of the CodeFlare project that are all coming into OpenShift AI. The first is the CodeFlare SDK that we've created. And with it, data scientists can, from within their notebook, their Jupyter notebook, or maybe it's VS Code, or whatever the tool of their environment of their choice is, they can submit requests onto the OpenShift AI platform on OpenShift for the compute resources that they need. Uh, with a very simple Pythonic interface, they can request things like Ray clusters to use Ray to train their models. They can submit jobs like PyTorch jobs using TorchX to train the model. So they have a very friendly environment that, they're, that is simple to use, that they can run from within the, the environments they're already using, and you can use the training tools that they're already using, all on OpenShift AI. At the same time, the two other components of CodeFlare are MCAD, multi-cluster app dispatcher, and InstaScale. These two components really simplify your operations team's jobs. First, with MCAD, we allow operations teams to define resource quotas for different teams of data scientists. We allow them to build out queues of requests for resources and ensure that the highest priority requests take precedence. At the same time, InstaScale allows the operations teams to configure the cluster, to the OpenShift cluster, to automatically scale up and down in response to resource requests in that queue. And that means that expensive cloud resources like nodes with GPUs are only provisioned when you actually need them, when you actually have jobs in the queue that need them. So all of this is coming together on the training side, but Really, to get value out of your AI, you need to be able to serve it for production inference requests. 
And really, just being able to serve a model for real-time requests is, is kind of table stakes at this point, right? All of our competition can do that. In OpenShift AI, uh, there are a few key differentiators that we add on. First, by running on OpenShift, we get a lot of things that we can offer you, right? So you can, uh, Kubernetes allows you to automatically scale up and down any application in response to production demands, and that's true of our, of our, AI, of our AI models as well. Similarly, we can do things like automatic upgrades of your models and canary rollouts, so you can get your newest models to production faster and more safely with no downtime to production. In OpenShift AI, we also support a number of model runtimes, Triton Server, Watson Runtime, Hugging Face TGI. Um, that means you can take any model, whether you've built it in-house, whether no matter what tra fra training framework you've used, no matter maybe you got it off the shelf from Hugging Face's library, uh, and you can run it all on a single consistent platform. You can also take a model that you built or take one off the shelf and customize it, as Carlos was talking about, so that you can get, to get your models in production faster and you don't have to go through the process of creating a model from scratch if you want to take one off the shelf and customize it to your use case. So again, we have the consistent serving runtime that can run anywhere. And this means that you can train your models in one location, you can serve them in a different location if you need to train them on-prem with your very safe proprietary data, very secure proprietary data, proprietary data, serve them in any number of cloud environments on the edge, all on the same consistent platform. Lastly, you may have heard of, Watts, uh, of IBM's new offering in this space, watsonx.ai. I want to mention watsonx.ai is actually built on top of OpenShift AI. So in addition to that core platform level, IBM gives you a number of uh, included base foundation models that are built to specific downstream tasks. And they also include a number of UIs and guardrails that enterprises need to get AI delivered into production faster and more safely. I mentioned Ray br briefly as, as a really important project that we're including in OpenShift AI for training models. I'm going to hand it to Hung Chiao now, who's going to tell you a little bit about what our two companies are doing together there. All right, thanks, Alex. Uh, so we have been talking AI the whole day. Like, what's the role of Ray and Kubray in this? So uh, Ray and Kubray helps you run like machine learning jobs and services in digi distributed manner easily. Like, if you have ter uh, large amounts of data, like terabytes, and you want to run it for hours or even days. Um, you might want to consider using like Ray and KubeRay. Uh, that's why uh, companies like IBM and like OpenAI, Pinterest, and Airbnb like uh, use adopt Ray in in their like internal uh, like machine learning infrastructure. Um, and why is like KubeRay important? So so first of all, it's built by the Ray official team. Uh, with, with the best practice to managing the Ray applications uh, out of box. And second, uh, so it's open and extensible. It's designed to be easily integratable with cloud native projects like FluentD, Kubernetes, Prometheus, etc. And, and finally, uh, it's purely co open source community driven. And we want to evolve with the community like uh, continuously. And we can see here, like, QRay enable like data scientists and, and machine learning engineers to like easily like uh, managing the Ray things. So we have Kubernetes managing the infra side. We have Ray like as the framework to develop machine learning applications, and we work QRay as the bridge between the two to help you manage Ray applications on Kubernetes easily. Um, and and Ray and QRay. Instead of like um, saying this is one company's project, it's more like a community co collaboration. Majority of the code is um, contributed by the, the community. In, in Ray team, we strongly believe that uh, only open community can drive the long-term sustainable success of any project. Like for example, um, we, we have like in, in any scale, we understand how to use Ray, but like uh, we don't, but outside of Ray and stuff, we have like fo awesome folks from IBM and to contribute features like MCAT, which is doing like multi-cluster uh, Ray application delivery, and also like yeah, 
uh, did this kind of stuff. That's how we, we see the, like, things like uh, open source community drive like, uh, bigger success. All right? So for the next time, we'll introduce Carlos to. All right. Thank you very much. All right, so let's see all of this in action, right? So in the last five minutes we have, we wanted to share with you the NASA use case. IBM Research, uh, uh, we have been working with NASA for the past uh, two years. And if you think uh, training ChatGPT, it's a big task. Uh, you have to see how big are some of the data sets for geospatial data. So we're talking about the petabytes of data, right? Uh, this is mostly public from uh, some of the uh, satellite uh, uh, network that, uh, of course, NASA operates. And the challenge here is, uh, can we come up with a, a very general model, uh, much like what we do in language, that you can then uh, fine tune for specific uses? Things like, for example, you want to study um, wildfire patterns, right? In the past, you need to create a model specific for that pattern. Imagine that I can train now a foundational model on some of this geospatial data, fine tune for that use case, and get some nice results, right? Now imagine if you can take the same model and stu study, for example, f uh, flood mapping and so on, right? That's what we started to do with NASA, and that's what we did, actually. So we trained the very first geospatial foundation model. I'll tell a, a, a bit more about it in a second. But I want to show what uh, we really wanted from a platform perspective, right? So I told you that the platform that you're building should cover the end-to-end -end life cycle foundation model, and that's pretty much what we want to do uh, jointly with NASA. Because they need the platform that goes across all the environments, right? So today, if you go in this field, there'll be a lot of stacks out there, but they always bring you back to some specific backend, right? And that's the challenge. Here, we want to build on, on, on open source technology in a way that you can take this to all the environments, meaning that uh, I can go do pre-training on-prem, for example. I can do some of the fine tuning on a public cloud environment, for example. And then I can go and do inference closer to my data, right? Um, and uh, I'll give you, I'll show this uh, in action because it's exactly what we did with them, right? Left hand side, you guys saw this before. This is the training and validation stack. What you see uh, playing in the video, and I hope you guys can see this, so I'll actually get out of the way. Uh, this is what the scientist actually sees, okay? These are very high level use experience. They start with a Jupyter notebook, very similar to what they, I mean, they use on the laptop, right? That's the bit of the stack, right? It has all these layers of abstraction in a way that I don't have to expose our scientists, our user to uh, YAML files, Docker images, all of that, right? This is how we train the geospatial model, for example. You can drive everything from Jupyter notebook with all the layers of automation that we share. Uh, we have resources spun up. Uh, uh, underneath, right? So this is running with uh, 256 GPUs. It takes several days to train, of course, right? Um, uh, it can go all the way to thousands of GPUs sometimes. This was trained on a very large GPU cluster on IBM Cloud. Once you're done with the model, the model goes into object storage now, and then NASA can deploy these on their own AWS account where they have full control, and that's what also we did with that. So here now, we have the scientists fine-tuning the models. Again, driving this from the Jupyter Notebook, very similar to what they, de they do, I'm sorry, on their local laptop. In this case, each of the fine-tuned tasks would take like four GPUs. Uh, this is the process. They can just carry this over to any environment. Here, in fact, they don't even see that they're running on AWS. We can take the same experience and run on-prem, for example. Uh, they get some of the results so they are uh, familiar to. Uh, they can fine tune the model, and then when the model is done, we can inference the model, and this is how it looks like, right? So can I, can I come up with a, a given area, for example? This one is for wildfire patterns. I can select some of the patterns, I can give a date, and you see some uh, nice identification of patterns coming up, is running up. So these are the places that got affected, is all driven by a foundational model, right? This is a nice UI that can put on top of the stack that we described. And again, all um, very familiar to scientists. They don't have to learn a lot of the plumbing. All of these, absolutely portable. You can run these anywhere you want. And that's what we did with NASA. Uh, this, in fact, if you haven't heard yet, this is part of uh, the, uh, this is actually the geospatial model that we released uh, on Hugging Face. It's available today. If you haven't heard before, you can Google about this. Uh, there's a lot of people talking about this. We're actually very proud. It got a lot of attention. It was the very first one. And that's how we end. Uh, there are next steps. I'll save for later. I'll let you guys read. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to follow up. All right? Thank you very much.